What's up guys, Jared here. The name Sterling Archer brings to mind a few glorious, if disturbing, images. Whizzing bullets that rarely hit anything, Bloody Marys for breakfast, and an adult secret agent with a Category 4 edible complex. My head hurts, and I have no father! But what if paying attention to who raised Archer could give us greater insights into some of his more unique quirks? Walson here, dressed like some sort of cattle rapist. No, not his mom. Have you seen the show? We mean the reliable friend who guided him through his most formative years. That's right, the glowing screen of parental guidance and cultural formation, the TV. Because maybe Archer's profound bond with 1980s cinema and TV, I uh, no longer wish to be represented by TV's Michael Gray, can help us understand his inability to form healthy bonds with human beings. Now, most American kids put in a solid amount of time in front of the magical box of wonders. But ideally, it serves as a source of entertainment, not as a stand-in for, you know, necessary human interactions. So if we want to understand what makes Archer so archery, we need to look at how his childhood consumption of film and television turned him into the sort of adult who thinks this is normal. I don't care, Pam! Now having said that, would you please come in this dirty toilet stall and have sex with me? So let's find out how being raised on screen can seriously screw a person up in this Wisecrack edition on Archer, Raised by TV. And as always, spoilers ahead. But before we jump in, I want to take a second to remind you to check your voter registration status. This week we're partnering with Global Citizen, a nonpartisan organization to help you learn more about participating in the upcoming November 3rd election. If you haven't checked out your registration status since 2016, now is the time to do it since we're only 39 days away from the presidential election. Make sure all your info is up to date and make a plan to vote. When you check your status with Global Citizen, you can also enter to win cool rewards from popular artists like Billie Eilish, Lenny Kravitz, and more. Visit the link in the description for more information. And now, back to the show. In case you've been on the Archer family liquid diet and forgot what the show is about, a quick refresher. Archer's first seven seasons take place in a vaguely Cold War-esque timeline that shares all of our pop culture points of reference, Garate, the Dane cook of martial arts, while playing fast and loose with everything else. Archer, who works for his mother Mallory, is a top-tier international spy with a penchant for boozily bungling missions. Oh, also for the past few seasons he's been in a lifeless coma. But the show goes on inside his bizarre unconscious as he dreams dreams up new adventures for his team set everywhere from 1940s LA to outer space. As we see through flashbacks in the series, Archer's childhood was not great. His mom abandoned him as a baby, leaving him under the care of a stiff British butler and heroin addict Woodhouse. Upon her return, his mother makes up for lost time by moving houses and accidentally forgetting to tell Archer. Just like that Christmas break when I moved and forgot to give my new address to his stupid boarding school. She also steals his bike to teach him a lesson. You stole my bike? I came home from work and it was just lying on the sidewalk and I thought, oh, well, this will teach him. Beats him with a paddle when he cries and turns him into a full-fledged gambler gambling addict and alcoholic before he loses all his baby teeth. Real mother of the year stuff. My mama told me how much she loved me all the time. Exactly. Look how you turned out. We don't know much else about his childhood, but none of it seemed great. He once spent five weeks in the hospital after getting a hardcore prep school swirling. However, we do know that Archer's childhood hero was none other than the pride of Florida State University, Burt Reynolds. This suggests that Archer was busy forming attachments to the people on his TV screen. Well, then we better keep Dr. Bellows away from Jeannie. No. While his mom was out doing spy stuff and his caretaker was in doing heroin stuff. While we don't actually see Archer watching TV, the pop culture he absorbed as a kid clearly functions as a crucial layer of his character. But for all we know, they're building a Gundam suit with bazookas for hands. And being raised by television puts Archer right at home in modern culture, where kids between two and five spend about 32 hours a week watching the boob tube. Coincidentally, that's also how much time I spend each week wondering what Woody would say to me if granted the power of human speech. But anyway, if Archer spent his childhood absorbing ad-based content while being profoundly socially isolated and ignored by his sole parental figure, what are the long-term effects? Let's start with one of the most crucial aspects of childhood development, learning quote-unquote normal cultural and social practices. For instance, saying please and thank you, knowing the boundaries of polite conversation, and so on. Most kids pick this stuff up via their family, school, church, or local dojo. Learning this stuff helps us functionally participate in society and get along with others. It also helps us develop healthy social boundaries so that we don't get an erection in front of our mother, inspired by the thought of her dying. The thought of me dead gives you an erection? 
But Archer, who grew up essentially parentless, friendless, and without any cultural or religious structure, lacks the type of socialization that most functional members of society have. That's a big reason why he has such a hard time connecting with other people and always seems hopelessly out of sync with his colleagues, lovers, and friends. Ironic, isn't it? I'm not sure that's technically irony. What? This is like O. Henry and Alanis Morissette had a baby and named it this exact situation. No! Yes, it's... it is! See, instead of learning about culture through observing genuine human interactions, Archer has learned everything through the small screen. And his reactions to a whole number of scenarios show that he'd be more at home in an episode of M.A.S.H. Thanks, Radar. Or the Flintstones. Kicking it bedrock style. Than he ever is in the normal world. He can't even appreciate Krieger being a good listener without comparing him to Oprah, the best conversation on daytime television. Seriously, Krieger, you are my Oprah. Archer's problem is that he's unable to draw a clear line of demarcation between the world as it appears on screen and the real world. A study carried out by the Canadian Pediatric Society on the effects of television viewing on child development found that the inability of young children to distinguish everyday reality from what happens on screen, along with their efforts to make sense of competing experiential realms, may interfere with and impede executive function. Which is to say, the difficulty of separating between real life and TV life as a child can eventually make real life adult tasks like separating our professional lives from our sex lives more difficult. Archer's own problem in distinguishing the screen world from the real world bleeds into every aspect of his life, from his blunt seduction techniques to his over-the-top spy antics. In Archer's TV-addled brain, every real-life mansion is probably hiding a Scrooge McDuck-style coin vault in the basement. Somewhere in this mansion, I have to assume, is a gigantic Scrooge McDuckian vault. But even more basic to becoming a functional human is understanding how language works. That doesn't just mean the literal definition of words, but also how they function in a social context. It's knowing that the phrase, it's lit, doesn't mean the party house is on fire. And our buddy Sterling didn't learn about the social function of language from observing organic human interactions or from a helpful teacher or therapist. He learned it by absorbing dialogue written by a room full of Ivy grads in sweatpants. See, normal human language revolves around communicating ideas, subtext, and the nuances of human emotion. But the dialogue in movies and television serves the purpose of creating entertaining narratives and keeping easily distracted eyeballs glued to the screen. Because of this, it's often laced with the type of over-the-top verbiage that might sound normal when The Rock says it, but would be ridiculous in real life. A badass line might read on screen, You tell him I'm coming! And hell's coming with me, you hear? but probably won't work when shouted in a rowdy Dave & Buster's. Archer's attempts at badassery are always imbued with a hint of patheticness. In trying to imitate what he saw on screen, he becomes a caricature of it. Something about I rescue Lana and she begs me to take her back so then Cyril commits suicide. I swear to God I had something for this. That's because our buddy Sterling's conception of language was shaped not by interacting with his peers, but by observing rousing on-screen dialogue. At least he didn't grow up on Gilmore Girls. They talk so fast, and all that coffee, it's just all too much. In the moments just before the act, Oh God! We were actually discussing modern-day Marxism in America, which is not what I would have deemed a come-and-get-it sort of conversation, but nevertheless, he came and got it, and I have to figure out what that means to me on a psychological level. There's no more obvious example of this than Archer's favorite way to call out perceived innuendo. Um, phrasing? Because TV both wants to be sexy and appeal to your grandma on Poughkeepsie, it often relies on veiled sexual references. Innuendos that we all kinda get, but don't really raise eyebrows. And while these jokes may be normal in the conference room of Dunder Mifflin, That's what she said. In the real world, people usually just mean what they say, especially in the workplace. But because Archer's brain expects dialogue and not conversation, he sees this type of thing everywhere. Even when he can barely get a word out, he can always muster up a Phrasing. And while Archer has a pretty good vocabulary, his whole understanding of the social function of language seems to be deeply shaped by years of consuming TV. As a result, he not only misreads things said by others, I thought you put it on autopilot. It just maintains course and altitude. It doesn't know how to find the only airstrip within a thousand miles so it can land itself when it needs gas. And I, uh misunderstood the concepts. But also says wildly offensive or out of bound things only to be surprised that they didn't go over smoothly. Hey, you wanna smell something? Swear to God, Mr. Archer, I have a John Speed dial. He talks to normal folks like he's playing the role of an American James Bond reboot, which I mean he is, but you get what I'm saying. Now we're not trying to say that consuming too much pop culture has made Archer dumb. Far from it. The guy is able to drop a Herman Melville reference on a dime. And I would prefer not to. Bartleby the Scrivener. Anybody? And he speaks like 10 languages. Hey, 
Yardcard! Thomas Umalainen and Las Cavario Clubi. But because he considers Hollywood speak to be what's normative, he's left perpetually out of sync when conversing with others. It's like trying to learn how to drive a car by watching the Fast and the Furious movies. What makes perfect sense on screen only leads to you flipping your Ford Fiesta in real life. But my god, is it a glorious ride up until that point. Of course, this is Archer's problem. He's learned how to be human through observing what he's seen in fictional programming meant to entertain, not educate. Now, obviously, we'd be remiss not to mention Archer's most obnoxious quality, his super, hyper, definitely troubling, overcompensating masculinity. But I've also cut back on, you know... On what? Surely with you, that could almost literally be anything. Anonymous sex, if you must know. While the contemporary version of Hollywood masculinity is often someone slight and hairless like Timothy Chalamet, Archer's vision of masculinity was shaped by the previously mentioned pile of perfect chest hair with a human growing out of it, Burt Reynolds. Famous for playing the charming badass who beats your ass by day and seduces your wife by night, Reynolds had an iconic run of films in the 70s and 80s and was a massive sex symbol. <laughs> Of course, Reynolds was an actor playing to hyped up masculine stereotypes, not an actual human being embodying them. But for a young archer, he was the model of manhood, a sort of 2D father figure filling the hole left by his biological father's absence. And not to get too Freudian, but the one time Archer meets his real father, he gives him a stuffed alligator for his birthday. Archer's favorite Reynolds film, none other than the 1976 classic, Gator. So, Archer's projection of a father figure onto Mr. Reynolds is not without some sort of reptilian connection. Oh, and it's kind of vaguely in play that Reynolds could be Archer's father, so maybe the gator thing is less Freudian and more literal. No. Remember how I said I kinda have a date? Oh, it's kinda with your mom. Oh, right, right, right. Regardless, masculinity is the most important thing, and if it means one thing for Sterling Archer, it means sex. Lots and lots of sex. Sex basically whenever, wherever, and with whomever. One of the only times in the show that he seems to actively avoid sex is when he meets a 16-year-old, but he bookends their interaction by asking her to hit him up when she turns 18. Literally, the minute you turn 18, please call me. Classy, I know. But is it shocking that someone who learned everything from TV and film would have this view of sex? Shoot him, Cyril, but just him. I I think the twins are warming up to me, right? Are you guys, am I getting some signals? After all, even most commercials have a sexual angle that guarantees if you buy the right body spray, you'll immediately be swimming in intercourse. And those are just things that play in between all the shows and movies where in the final analysis, everything was really about someone successfully getting laid. As we noted in a previous video, much of Archer's persona seems modeled around James Bond who is basically Burt Reynolds that went to an English prep school and has fancy gadgets. And if you've seen even nine seconds of a James Bond film, you've seen him seducing a woman named something like Hungry Bottoms or Furry Kitten. So why wouldn't Archer's personality largely revolve around the utter importance of affirming his masculinity by sleeping with women? It's not like he was exposed to any other model of how a guy should act or exist in a relationship. But hey, Archer's twisted upbringing at least kind of comes together at one point when the real Burt Reynolds, his ideal father figure, ends up sleeping with his mom. We were meeting for drinks! I mean, obviously, sex was implied, but... Uh, and since when is he your hero? Archer initially tries to break them up and kidnaps maybe Papa Bert. But the two eventually kind of bond, and Bert gives Archer some insight on his fear of emotional vulnerability. I don't care about them! Yes, you do. You just pretend you don't because you're afraid. The inclusion of real Burt Reynolds in the episode seems like further evidence that the creators of the show know that watching one-dimensional Reynolds characters ruined Archer, but also that seeing the emotional complexity of the real Burt just might help him grow. Of course, while most of us don't have tinnitus from a lifetime of bullets whizzing by our ears and somehow not killing us, this is what I was talking about with the whole tinnitus thing. Many of us have spent more hours than we might want to admit staring at screens in theaters, in living rooms, and on our phones while we take our ninth bathroom break at work. So maybe we're all a bit more like Archer than we'd like to think. But what do you think, Wisecrack? Is Archer a case study in why sometimes we need to step away from the screens and learn how to be human? Or are we just using this show to work through our own childhood abandonment issues? Let us know in the comments. As always, mad thanks to our patrons for all your support. Hit that subscribe button like it's the source of your emotional dysfunction. And as always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace. Oh,